So hello and good morning everyone. Good to see that so many people are interested in knowing more about the new concurrency model inside Java, the virtual threads and everything. So that's also the topic for today. I'm going to give you an introduction and tell you all about the pitfalls of Java's new concurrency model. My name is David Flemings, and I am a software developer in the Netherlands for around six or seven years now at Team Rockstars IT. It's a consultancy company. Um, if after this um, event you have any questions or want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter or some multiple ways to contact me uh, through my website or also some examples that you have will be shown today. We have some explanation and some diagrams, so it should all be clearly structured. So let's start. And I want to start today's talk with the outline and the current situation of what the current way of concurrency is inside Java. So we'll see what is the current trading model we use now, and then slowly see what are the problems with it and how can we improve on that. And then we will slowly go into the virtual threads and how they work behind the scenes, what they do, what they are, and how they work, and how we can create uh, a million of them, or two million, as we have seen this morning, and then how we can manage them using structured concurrency, because then we have all these threads, and then we want to somehow group them as a single unit of work and then we can, that we can use structured concurrency for. And at the end of the presentation, there's still some time for your Q&A. So before I really start, I want to have a word of caution. It's still a work in progress. The virtual threads, they are not in the mainstream version of Java yet. They are, going, they are targeted for Java 21, so in September, everyone can enjoy them. I don't expect them to change a whole lot anymore from now on. But it's especially the structured concurrency part that is still, heavily, uh, still very much in development. So some may methods may change and some wording, some names, but the whole idea behind them will stay the same. So <clears throat> let's get started. And this is how we create a single, or a single thread in Java. Can I get a hand up from everybody who has done something like this before? Ah, that's pretty much oh, a lot of people, which is really great. So what happens here is that we call the thread constructor and we ask, can we have a thread that we can use inside our application? So what happens is we make a call to the operating system and ask the operating system, can you create a thread for me that I can use inside my application? And the operating system is like, yeah, I can do that for you, but I will need to reserve some memory for this thread, so let's say around a megabyte, and then you will have a thread that you can use inside your application, which is all fine. Then we come back, back inside our application, and then we have a thread that you can use. So what we can say is that a thread inside Java is just a very thin wrapper around a thread that is managed and scheduled by the operating system. And because of that, uh, and we have virtual threads uh, with Java 21, it gets kind of confusing. What kind of threads is he talking about? Is he talking about the virtual ones or the ones that are managed and scheduled by the operating system? And as you can see hinted in this, well, the title of the slide, is that it says platform threads. And that is because to, to tell the difference between them is that we now give them the name, well, platform threads. So when we talk about threads that are managed and scheduled by the operating system, we are talking about platform threads. And as we will see later, is that virtual threads well, won't be managed by the operating system, but that's a story for later. So when I come back to the little example code on screen, I have my thread, I call the start on it, and it will start my task, and it will run inside a platform thread. So the ideal way of using threads inside Java would be to, for each thread, or for each task that I have, I would create a single thread that I can use. It's very easy for us programmers because I get my task, I'm programming, I'm creating this function, and then I'm thinking, I want to run this inside a thread. And then I create a thread on the spot, I give it the task that I want to run, and when this task is done, I will just throw this thread away, and the garbage collector will clean it up for me, which is a really convenient way for us to program our software, but we don't make the best use of our resource because every time I'm going to create a thread, I have to go to this operating system. Can you create a thread for me? It will reserve some memory. 
which are very expensive operations, and then I have to go back inside my application, and then I can continue. So if I do this every time for each task that I have, it's going to be very time consuming, and I'm not making the best use of the resources that are available to me. So with Java 5, we are encouraged to use the executor services instead. And what they do behind the scene is that they just create a thread pool for us to use. So they do all the work for us. The only thing that we have to do is submit tasks every time we want something to run. So as you can see at the right, I have this small well, thread pool. It's the blue box with the three threads in it. And I submit some tasks to it. So every time I submit a task, a thread that is doing nothing inside the pool will pick up a task and will start running it. But this also has some downsides. Well, it's <clears throat> and one of them is the thread locals. If I have a task that sets a thread local variable on one of my threads inside the thread pool and forgets to unset it, this thread with this thread local will be put back inside the pool and another task can pick up, uh, or just, sorry, this thread will pick up a new task and this ta task will <clears throat> uh, be able to see this thread local variable. And at that point, you are leaking your thread local variables to other to, uh, to into other tasks, which isn't the best way. And of course, blocking uh, waste resources, because when I have a thread inside my pool, and uh, it has a task, for example, to, uh, let's say, make a call to a database or to a web service, while it is making this call, it's waiting. It just blocks, and it's waiting for something to return which isn't the best use because while it's waiting, it could also pick up some new task to run, but it isn't. And then we just have a waste because then we are blocking this thread, this very expensive resource, with just waiting, which isn't ideal. And then we get into async programming. Async programming tries to solve this by, well, not trying to block, really. And for us programmers, it is very hard, to, or in my opinion, it's very hard to write. It's harder to read, especially the week or two after you've written it. And it's very hard to debug. But the, the positive side of it is it makes very good use of the resources. It makes very good use of the resources that are available to us. So <clears throat> it's good for the computer, but it's a little bit uh, less for the developer. And this is where virtual threads come in. So virtual threads are just an alternative implementation of the thread clause, which means that they aren't there to replace the platform threads that we are currently familiar with. We still have those, but we get a new option, and that are the virtual threads. And the virtual threads are just a concept that yeah, lives inside the GVM. So the operating system doesn't know anything about them. And the great thing about this is, is that now the heap, so the memory for this thread, now lives, in, sorry, the stack of this virtual thread now lives inside the heap. So we don't have to reserve some memory for the platform thread that we would otherwise have created. So for a platform, for, sorry, for a virtual thread, we just create the virtual thread and it will just give it a little bit, a very small stack uh, to use, and it can just grow as needed. So we can just start out with a very small amount of memory and just grow as we would need to, <coughs> as we would need to have for this thread. And combining this, that we, so we don't have to call, make a call to the operating system, we don't have to allocate a lot of memory, this makes those threads very cheap to create. Well, how cheap do you ask? So I created this little uh, nice diagram, I think it's nice. So using the native memory tracking, I had a simple application that uses uh, 40, 64 megabytes of memory uh, as heap space. And then I just started creating threads. So I just started with a single platform thread and a single virtual one. And it's just very hard to see, but the platform threads still win. They still use a little less memory than a single virtual thread will use. That and why that is, we will see later. But when we go into 10 threads, so we have 10 threads of each, you will still see that the, that the platform threads still use a little bit more memory 
than the virtual threads do. And then we go into bigger numbers, 100, 1,000, then 10,000, and you see slowly seeing that number rise, and then it doubles, and then well, it really skyrockets into well, almost 500 megabytes. So these platform threads really start to use a lot of memory when you have a lot of them, while the virtual threads, well, virtually, use almost no memory. Or, well, <coughs> it's still, uh, they grow very little over time until, well, we go from 10,000 to 100,000, and <coughs> you know, then it doubles, but the number uh, is 10 times as huge. So you may be wondering why doesn't he have the uh, 100,000 platform threads? And that's because the well system crashed because I also ran out of memory. So you can either see it as platform threads are very uh, resource uh, friendly at the 100,000 threads, or virtual threads are a lot better. So that's enough of me talking. So let's now switch to the demo and see how we can create uh, virtual threads. So I have you on screen. Is it readable? Let's just zoom in a little bit. So on screen, I have two runnables. One that prints Hello G Prime to the console and just one sleep task. So now let's just create a single virtual thread. So as I've said before, they are just an alternative implementation. So I can, just, I can still store them inside a thread. And I'm going to call this thread VT. You still don't see very well. Sorry, too many people. Uh, what? I ah, yeah. Uh, settings. Is this better? And bigger. Is this good for everyone? Ah, great. So I have here this uh, thread. I'm going to create a virtual thread. And as I have said before, you, uh, it's just an alternative implementation. So I can still store it inside a thread. So instead of using the thread constructor, I'm going to use a static builder method called the start virtual thread, which will create a virtual thread for me. And it will start running immediately after uh, calling this method. And I'm going to give it the print task. And I'm going to give the virtual thread a chance to print it to the console by joining it. So this would probably also be a little bit too small. Let's zoom in. And as you can see, it prints a hello G prime to the console, which is really nice. So we, ha we do have now this one static builder method, but we also have a builder. And that I can use the off virtual. And as you can see, it gives me two options, off virtual and off platform. And using the off, plat off, off platform, I will create a platform thread. And using off virtual will, of course, create a virtual thread. So use the, I will use the off virtual, and I will set, uh, for example, the name. I will call this VTG prime. And I can give it a unstarted task, uh, which will also be the print task. and call vt.join. But then, because it's an unstarted task, I would have to start it myself. And then when I run this method, you can see it prints g prime to the console. Nothing really that it different from the first example. So as I've said with Java 5, you are encouraged to use the executor services instead. So with Project Loom and the virtual threads, we also get a new executor service. Uh, let's call this virtual thread executor, just VTE for short. And I have the new virtual thread per task executor. And this virtual thread per task executor for each task that I submit, it will use a virtual thread to run that task. And as you can see, IntelliJ already gives me a hint. It makes this yellow. And that's because the executors now implement the auto closable interface, which is really nice. So I don't have to close my executor myself. But I can use it inside a try with resource statement. So let's add that too. Do 
doing something wrong. Executed service. Thank you very much. So I have here this executor service, which implements the outer closable interface. And inside this execute and inside this try, I can create the virtual threads that I want. And when I exit this try, all my virtual threads have to be done running. So let's submit three tasks, just three times the print task. And start running. And as you can see, it prints hello G prime three times to the console. And I don't have to call the join on each of the threads because I will have, uh, because when I exit this try statement, all my threads have to be done running, which is really nice. So as I've said in the beginning, you can also create a lot of threads. So let's do that now. So using a simple for loop, I can just create, well, as many threads as I want. In this case, 10,000. Let's give it the sleep task, otherwise my console isn't going to like it. I run it, run it. It finishes and it created 10,000 threads. So there are no more memory issues when you create a lot of threads, which is really nice because they are so that cheap to use or to create. So how does this work behind the scenes? Because as, you, as I've just shown, I have created 10,000 virtual threads, but I ran it on a laptop, which only, well, it doesn't have 10,000 cores. So how do these virtual threads run? So how does it work? So here I have a yeah, very simple diagram, and I have the virtual threads that I just created at the top, and the carrier threads at the bottom. So my virtual threads don't directly run on the system. They run on what is called a carrier thread. And a carrier thread is just a simple platform thread, but, it's, but it is designed to run virtual threads. So each of my carrier threads gets assigned a pool of virtual threads it has to run. Uh, it uses a fork join pool. So each carrier thread has a pool of virtual threads it has to work through. And because it also has a, uh, it uses a, a work stealing scheduler, when a carrier thread is done with its virtual threads, it will just steal a virtual thread from another carrier thread's pool. So the best thing about this is that now my carrier threads, which are my very expensive platform threads, are always running. They will continue running, they have always something to do, because there are always virtual threads to run. So how does a carrier thread know when do I switch from one virtual thread to another? And that is done with mounting and unmounting. So here I have my simple carrier thread, and it is running this virtual thread. So it is running happily, everything is nice, life is great. And then it encounters a blocking method. So this could either be a call to a web service, to a database, really anything, just a sleep. And then my virtual thread is blocked. And when it is blocked, it will get unmounted from my, virtual, from my carrier thread, which means that the memory this virtual thread uses is being copied back inside the heap, and the new virtual thread will take its place. So my old virtual thread is taken off my carrier thread, and a new virtual thread will be run inside my carrier thread. And my virtual thread that was running is now back in the heap. It's waiting for something to return, to continue, but in the meantime, my carrier thread can just continue, which is really great, because then my very expensive resource is working. But not every method is ready yet. So for example, if you encounter a synchronized block, a object.wait, or you make a call to native code using GNI or access the file system, at those points in time, your virtual thread is, block is being pinned to the carrier thread. And when it is pinned, it means that it can't be taken off its carrier thread. So then you are still back in the old situation, and it, acts and it behaves the same like the platform threads. You just have a task, and it's running on its carrier thread. So when you encounter these methods, it won't be unmounted, and another virtual thread can't take its place. 
And that's where the pitfalls uh, also come in. So for example, if you have a long running calculation uh, that never blocks, your virtual thread also will never be taken off your carrier thread. It will be stuck, it will run its calculations, and when it's done, only then it will switch to another virtual thread. Also, pooling virtual threads is a big no-go, yeah, because you're not supposed to do that. They are so cheap to create that you just have to create them when you need to. So pooling is something you should never do. And something that also some people are doing is using a, a, using a thread plus some kind of lock to limit the amount of connections to a database. So <clears throat> SF said because virtual threads, uh, you that you should never pull them, you should also never use them in some kind of lock situation. And of course, some old libraries may use these unsupported methods. And in those cases, you may not get the performance that you may have expected to have. So th those are some things you have to watch out for when using virtual threads. So now we have a lot of virtual threads that we can use. So how can I group them and use them as a single unit of work? And that's where structured concurrency comes into place. It helps us manage the lifetimes of the virtual threads that we are creating. And before I dive deep into what structured concurrency really is, I want to start with something that's also structured and we are all familiar with. And that's this very simple Java method. And it's called method A. And it makes two uh, method calls, one to method B and one to method C. And it returns a result uh, from these two methods. And there is this kind of relationship between, well, the parent method and the two uh, child uh, calls that it makes. And you can put it really in some kind of line, where we start with A at the top, then you start doing method B, C, and then you will have a result. And this is really nice because this relationship, it tells you when something happens, when you need to abort, when something, <coughs> when you don't have to continue anymore. So for example, if method B throws a exception, you know you don't have to call method C anymore. At that point in time, you can just stop. Uh, method C will never run. Method A will also stop, and the caller of method A will know something has happened, and I can act on it or not, but I'm not wasting any more resources, and it can just continue. And the same goes for method C. If method C throws an exception, I have only ran method B, and then at method C, I can stop, and well, that is it. So this is a very simple example of the flow of, well, <coughs> of, a stru of structured code. So now let's add some threads into it, this example and see how things can go wrong. So here I have the same method, but now it's method B and C, they use threading. And I will get my result later. And so they run now concurrently. And when just before exiting method A, I will to I'm going to create a result and return it to the caller. So now I'm going to do the same. What happens if method B throws a exception? So when method B throws a exception, my first method B, well, that thread will clearly be done. It won't run anymore. But then method C, which also has a thread, is still running. So I now have to go fetch it and can cancel it myself, which well, is possible, but it isn't really nice. And it's more code for me to type. And less code is more maintainable. So yeah, it's really great. But the same thing can happen with method C. And with method C, it's, uh, it's also a pity if it fails, but it's a little bit worse. Because then I have my method B, which is still running, this thread. And then I will <coughs> start my method C. It will start running. It will tr throw an exception at some point. But then my method B, this thread, if it takes five minutes, when I do this full get, I will have to wait the full time of my thread to finish before I can continue. And only at that time, when I do the bar.get, I will find out, hey, my thread has thrown an exception. I can't create results. So I have wasted a thread. I have wasted my time while I could just have stopped. So this is the, oh, and of course, if you have the parent thread, uh, if that fails, uh, then I have two threads running inside the system. They are leaked. So <clears throat> there is no connection to them. I have to, well, find some way to to cancel them, or else I have to leak two threads inside the system until they are done, which also isn't an ideal situation. 
so <clears throat> let's see how we can do this in code. So let's switch back to the second demo. And let's zoom in a bit. So what I want you to focus is, is that at this try, I use something that is called a structured task scope. And the structured task scope is what is used inside Java to use structured concurrency. And with Java 21, we get two, bil uh, two policies. And those policies will tell you how my threads will behave and when my structured task scope, when this will do shut down. So when my threads will be canceled. So as you can see, I here have the structured task scope at the top. And then I have what is called the shutdown on success, which is one of the two shutdown policies that I have by default that you'll get for free. And it, uh, it takes a string as the return type. And then I can use the scope. So the scope is the um, variable that I can use inside my, uh, <coughs> inside my try statement that I can use to fork new virtual threads. And each of my virtual threads that I will create using the scope object will adhere to my shutdown on success policy. And what the shutdown on success policy states is that I'm only interested in the first thread that finishes. So in the example, I scope two, or uh, using the scope, I will fork two new virtual threads. And I'm only interested in the first virtual thread that finishes. So that could either be the virtual thread that returns result one or result two. And then I will do a scope to join. And the scope to join will block. So the parent thread will block at this point. And it will wait for my two virtual threads uh, to be done, or at least the first one to be done. Because that's what my shutdown on success policy states. So when I continue from this join, I can use the scope object. And the scope object has a method called result. And the result method will get the result from the first thread that finishes. I don't have to fetch uh, myself which thread has finished first. I don't have to check it myself. But the scope knows which thread uh, finished first. So when I run this example, and let's zoom in a little bit, you can see that result two was the first thread that finishes. And then my result one thread will be uh, shut down by the scope <coughs> if it didn't finish in time <coughs> or, or as the first one. So that is how the shutdown on success policy works. Uh, so as I've said, there are two built-in uh, shutdown policies. And the other one is the shutdown on failure. And the shutdown on failure policy states that either all my threads, all my threads finish successfully, or if one throws an exception, then I'm not longer interested in the result, and I can just cancel all of them. And the, this structure task scope that works the same. I use a try with resource statement, and inside this try, I create the threads that I need. And as you can see, I use the scope. I fork two new threads. And both of them return a future. Uh, as I've said in the beginning of the presentation, it's still very much a work in progress. And they're still uh, well, debating over what it is going to be called when it is released. So for now, it's uh, in the current early access build, it is called uh, a future. But this, may, this is going to change probably to something of a subtask. It's going to behave the same. but just have some different methods of accessing the value. So <coughs> again, with the structured uh, task scope, I'm going to have to do a scope to join. The parent thread will, at this point, wait for my threads to finish. And when they are finished, I can continue. 
But you can also do something like have a deadline. And you can do the join, on, you can use the join on tail to set a deadline. So when the threads that I'm going to start are going to have to finish before, well, in this case, 10 seconds. So I give them 10 seconds to run. If they don't finish in time, I will just shut them down myself. And I'm no longer interested in the result. And then you can see something interesting. And this is the scope dot throw if failed. And the throw if failed will retrow the exception that has happened inside the thread that has failed the first, uh, that inside the first failed thread. So if one of these would throw a exception, I can retrow that same exception using the throw if failed method. So when I run this example, you can see that it prints result one and result two to the console. And the great thing about using the, the shutdown on success uh, structure task scope is that after this join and after this throw a field, when I go into my, uh, my print line, at this point in time, at this point in my code, I know that both of my threads or all the threads that I've started finished successfully because otherwise I would not have came to this point in my code. which is really nice. So now you have seen the two built-in shutdown policies, which are fine, but sometimes you need something a little bit more that fits, uh, fits your own project. And then you can create your own structured task scopes. But before I'm going to show that, let's give, me, you, let's give you a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'm going to create a, a structured task scope, or I'm going to extend one, that is going to return to me a product that is less than 50, or less than 100. So I've created three products. One uh, method call that returns me a product uh, of, well, of price 50, but it will wait 50 seconds. I have a product of uh, the price of 300, but I will wait 10 seconds before I can return that result. And then I have a product with a price of 200, which will return immediately. So here I am in my structure task scope. So to create your own structure task scope, you have to extend the structure task scope, and you, you can say, OK, I want my structure task scope to return a product. So here I have my class. It's called criteria scope. And I use a project volatile, private volatile product to temporarily store the product that has been found. And then I come into my handle complete. And the handle complete method is called by every virtual thread that either finish, finishes successfully or has failed. So you will always get a complete future object in your, as, as a parameter at the top. So this <coughs> is really the method that you are once you override, when you are going to create your own task scope. So the first thing that you will have to do, or I want to do, because I'm only interested in products that are worth, worth less than 100, is to check, did this thread finish successfully? Because I can't have a product if the thread didn't finish. So the first thing I have to do is check, what is the state of the virtual thread? So in this case, I'm only interested in virtual threads that have the state success. And then I'm going to check, is the result of my virtual thread, so of my future, less than 100? And if that's the case, I'm going to temporarily store my product. And then I'm going to call the shutdown method. And the shutdown method will shut down all the remaining virtual threads that are still running, because at this point, I have found my product that I want to use, and just a simple get method. So here I have, again, a try with resource statement. I create my new criteria scope that's going to return my product if it's less than 100. And then I'm going to use the same fork method that will create a virtual thread. And each of these virtual threads will run their own get product. So I have the get product 50, 300, and 200. 
and each of them will return a result. And then at the scope to join, my parent thread is going to wait. My method is going to wait for all my virtual threads to finish because at this point I have either found no products that match my description or I have found a product that I want to use. So let's see what this prints. So I'm going to run that method. And let's zoom in a little bit. And as you can see, those are the three states of my virtual threads. As you can see, both 50 and 300 return a success. So these two virtual threads did finish, but I didn't stop when I found my product that's with a price of 200 because it's worth too much. I only have 100, so I can afford it. But when my product 50 finished, at that point, I can just shut down my virtual threads. And that's why my product uh, of 300 has failed. Because it took too long to run. And I had already found a product that I want to use. So why continue at that point? And that's all you have to know about structured concurrency to start using it. And the pitfalls of structured concurrency really is managing the lifetimes of threads yourself. Because with structured concurrency, it makes it that easy to let, <coughs> to let the structured task scopes do it for you. And when you do it your own, there's always a chance that you will introduce new bugs. So my advice would be to really use structured concurrency when you can, because it's a really nice and powerful way to do so. And to summarize, all you need to get started, because I've talked a lot about virtual threads and structured concurrency, are just these two methods the start virtual thread and the new executor service with the new virtual thread pass executor. Those are the two methods that you are going to need when you want to start using virtual threads, which I really encourage you to do so because it's really fun to start playing with them. And I want to thank you for being here. So, are there any questions? Ah, oh, there's one, two. No. Have you used this in real projects? No, because it hasn't been, uh, well, it isn't really available yet. It's still in the preview. But I hope to do so when it's available uh, inside Java 21. So, yes? Yeah? Um, I don't know it by heart, but you can see it in the flight recorder when you use it, you can see when a virtual thread is pinned. And I think there is also a command line option that you can pass to your program, and then it will also say when threads are pinned, but I, I don't know it by heart. So. But it is there. There is an option to see if virtual threads are pinned. Yes? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't really know because I talked to some people at the Helidon project and they said they had an issue with the file system or they gave me the tip that it was a, a problem with the file system. It also specified it inside the Java Enhancements proposal, the JEP. So I have to also look into it. Maybe that has changed. Maybe they finally fixed it. So, <laughs> yes? Uh, you said that uh, for file I.O., yeah. uh, the virtual threads are still working, so they don't allow the video But uh, on the previous talk, the cast uh, showed exactly file I.O. examples with files of lines. It is still doing something, but then it's, uh, from the last time I checked, it was still being pinned to its carrier thread. 
But yeah, I would also have to verify if it's, if it's fixed and now it switches thread, threads. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how it is supported using the ad tra transactional, so I think it really depends on the framework and if they implement it at that point. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> I guess it would depend on the framework you're using. Well, if there are no more questions, then well, thank you for being here.